Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Movement Longevity Show. I'm here with, as always, Dr. Aaron Boynton. Doc, how are you doing today? I'm, uh, I'm actually very excited for this conversation uh, about tight hip flexors. Um, it's something I suffered from after my pregnancies and um, didn't really understand very well 30 years ago, but uh, I've got lots of fun things to share. And after meeting you, I think uh, you really helped me to um, further my knowledge. So I'm excited to share this with people. You say you're always excited when you have these presentations, Doc. <laughs> I like teaching. I like sharing knowledge. I don't know. It's something about uh, empowering people, you know, so that they can get out there and keep moving and doing what they love to do, which is what this show is all about. Yep. That's right. That's right. What have you been up to over the past week? Well, um, I've actually started doing um, a bit more spinning. Um, you know, the weather was kind of crappy. In fact, yeah. It was like horrible cold, wet, and we can't play tennis here, which I think we're the only place in the universe right now that can't play tennis. I'm really like quite annoyed. Ontario um, or Canada? Is that across Canada? Actually, it's just Ontario. Like I was just talking Ontario. to a friend of mine who lives in BC and she's out playing. And uh, so I'm like incredibly jealous, like beyond jealous and envious. Um, there's a tournament, actually. My favorite tournament is on right now this week in La Jolla at the La Jolla Beach and Racquet Club. It's the national hard court uh, championships. And oh my, man, the, the draw was really tough this year. So I'm gonna have to get working when I can get back out on the court. I'm so excited to go and challenge these ladies. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, and it, actually today I'm really excited because I was just outside walking the dog and it's beautiful. So I'm That's feeling gorgeous. better that the, you know, the sun is out and little blue sky always yeah. picks me up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's beautiful. I was out for an hour with the kids earlier in 45 minutes or something like that, but uh, just soaking it up. It's feels like summer is around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And we got a, we got a little pool. So last year um, I should have brought the picture up, but I bought one <laughs> of those little storage bins, those stacking storage bins that you put clothes or junk in um, that you're not using on a day-to-day -day basis. And that was our pool last year. Um, <laughs> but this year uh, I splurged and we've got a 10 foot pool that we're going to set up hopefully very soon so we can get the kids moving. I want to get, especially Cam, he hasn't, he doesn't have too much experience in the, in the water. So I want to get him just comfortable. Um, not, he's not going to turn into Michael Phelps. His arms are too short, but uh, yeah, I just want to get him comfortable around the water. I don't know. He's a pretty coordinated little guy. Like I can't believe how fast he is. And he, he moves incredibly well for a three-year-old. Like yeah. I, I I mean, you were telling about how he was riding his bike. Uh, yeah. Three-year-olds on a bike. That's pretty impressive. And, uh, yeah. But I always, yeah, I, I always think it's great to have kids safer and comfortable around the water. I, I, mm. I've had both my kids uh, in the pool at a very young age as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's important. I'm not great in the water. I think uh, I could go pretty well. But once, if anything off happens, like if I'm swimming in the lake and a wave hits me and I get a little bit in my nose, panic mode just <laughs> immediately sets in and I'm just like, ah, freaking out. Um, yeah. so I'm not super comfortable. I'm a decent swimmer, but I'm just, I'm not really, really comfortable. Uh, so I, I we, and my wife and I, she's even worse than me, but you, we definitely want to get our kids to be really comfortable around water. Um, so yeah, so that's, yeah, that's what I'm excited about when this hot weather touched us today. Got me thinking about that, setting that up. Um, nice. Before we get into it today, I just want to say hi to everybody who's here. I see uh, Ramon, Wendy, Caroline, Donna, Cheryl, oh, awesome. David, lots of regulars here. Good to see everybody. Good to see you all. Welcome again. Um, yes. So today we just have Joshua around on the back end helping out. Yusuf is, is off today, so I might be a little bit slower in finding questions. So, But at any rate, post your question when you have it in the chat, give us your age if you can and concise details and we will cover them after Dr. B um, concludes her presentation. And one last thing before we get that, I thought I'd share this. This was a little uh, video clip and I wanna make sure you guys, make sure your sound is, is nice and high for this one. Ha, ha, ha. 
Dr. B. <laughs> Naughty little kitty. Yes, I was. <laughs> Dr. Potty Mouth, should I call you? Oh, well, fortunately, I didn't hear that. I had selective hearing. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know if the sound came through. I tried to share it. I don't oh. know if it came through. <laughs> Did I say shit? <laughs> uh, fucking cat, you said. Oh, <laughs> okay. That was a video that Doc I... <laughs> is, is putting together for um, some knee differential diagnosis videos. Hopefully the sound came through. It was pretty funny when I was reviewing uh, the videos that you had done. Um, so oh, I thought funny. it was fun. Actually, I, I didn't hear that. And I, I do love my fucking cat, honestly. He's like, <laughs> he's crazy. He's, um, he's actually like a dog in a cat's body. And um, I've trained him now. He can sit, he can speak, um, but he's like, a, he's crazy about treats. And so he comes into the kitchen and whenever I open up my cupboard door, if I don't pay attention, he's jumping in there because he knows where the treats are. And then he's knocking everything out of the cupboard. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So that's why I call him my effing cat, but I adore him. <laughs> well, maybe I'll get that video in, in a future video on YouTube to make sure that the sound is like, that cracked me up. Anyway, let's get on to your presentation. Go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, and now we are going to talk about our hip flexors and particularly a muscle that I think is one of the most interesting muscles uh, and one of the most neglected muscles in our body, um, the psoas. But we, most people probably know this as the iliopsoas. And um, I wanna share actually my, uh, anatomy app here, um, the BioDigital app, to um, sort of highlight some really interesting facts about the, um, the psoas. What I've done here is, let me just see if I can get this centered a little better. Can you see my whole screen or is it just? Uh, I can see your whole PowerPoint presentation. Can you see my? Oh, can you see the BioDigital app right now? No, I cannot see that. Okay, let me see. Just the image, image, the image of the really psoas or the psoas there. Let me just minimize that. Now, can you see my? No, I think what happened is you're sharing your PowerPoint. But you're not sharing your entire desktop. So ah. if you stop sharing your stop sharing and then go back and share your entire desktop, you'll be good to go. Okay, hopefully that's- There's BioDigital. The, there's BioDigital. So we'll, we may have to do that again. Sorry, everybody. But here I was think, hoping I was gonna be really slick today. Left the cream master in. Oh gosh. Well, here we can get rid of that. Just <laughs> only you would pick that up. <laughs> oh no. Here, there they're gone now. Um, okay. <laughs> so the psoas is a really interesting uh, muscle or the iliopsoas because it has two origins. So the ili iliacus muscle in, uh, originates on the pelvic bone or the iliac bone, while the psoas itself originates from the lower thoracic spine all along the lumbar spine. And then the two muscles come together to insert on the lesser trochanter of the femur. And their job is primarily to flex the hip. But when you look at these muscles, they actually have very independent and different functions. The iliacus is a hip flexor. And I don't think that there's much controversy about that. But the psoas has a lot of different functions because you can see the, the um, psoas inserting on the lumbar spine is going to have an effect on all of the little motion segments in the thoracolumbar spine. So it acts not only as a flexor of the hip, but as a stabilizer of the spine. And I think a very neglected and important function of the psoas is actually a stabilizer of the hip when we're in an upright position. So when we're standing, the psoas is actually very intimately uh, involved with the hip joint. And you can see the psoas here, it comes down and inserts onto the lesser trochanter. And it's a little hard to see, but the femoral head um, of the, the hip joint is right here. So the, the psoas actually acts as a bit of a check rein. And when it contracts, it can actually keep that femoral head 
back and seated uh, and centrated within the hip joint proper. And so that is, I think, a really important function of the, um, of, of the uh, psoas muscle itself. And there's a bit of controversy as to whether the psoas actually flexes or extends the, the spine. Um, but I like to think of it as primarily a stabilizer of the spine. Now, there are other muscles around the hip that help with hip flexion. So if the psoas isn't doing its job, then we have the rectfem, which I just removed there, plus we have the TFL and the sartorius. So these are all muscles which can actually flex the hip. And um, they're important because um, they, normally they're just there as uh, synergistic muscles to help stabilize and flex the hip. But when the psoas isn't working properly, then these guys kick in and often become tight and weak as well. Finally, uh, I really wanted to look at how the psoas is related to the diaphragm. Whoop. Let's see if I can get this in here and tip it up a little bit, tip the body up. So we're now looking up into the abdominal cavity and what you can see here, here are the, the tendon, tendinous portion of the psoas. And this is the diaphragm, that's our breathing muscle. And it's like a dome and it inserts on the front of the spine and the aorta would actually come out of this area right here, it's not shown. Um, but this is called the crus of the diaphragm and there's one on each side of the aorta. And the crus is really connected to the psoas muscle. And it's interesting, when we look at these pictures of anatomy, it's a little different than when you look inside the body. Like if I was to look at this surgically, there wouldn't be this distinct space between these, um, these two structures. There's actually a very strong fascial bond between the diaphragm and the psoas. And you couldn't just sort of put your finger there and separate the two structures. You'd actually have to take a knife and cut them away. And the importance of this is that that kind of strong fascial bond means that they are in line and they can function together very um, intimately. So uh, the diaphragm and the psoas uh, work very um, closely together to help, I think, work with the rhythm of breathing and walking. Um, so the other and the last point about the psoas is that being so close to the spine here, the sympathetic nervous system has a chain of nuclei that run right along the, um, the vertebral bodies. And the psoas is one of those muscles that has more of an autonomic, uh, particularly sympathetic nervous system uh, uh, responsiveness, kind of like the muscles in our neck. We talked about that when we were talking about head forward carriage, where the length of the neck muscles also is influenced by the sympathetic nervous system. So if there's a fight or flight response, if you're stressed, the neck muscles tend to get tight. And similarly, the psoas can be affected in a similar way. But we're not as aware generally of the psoas muscle as we are of our, are of our neck, neck muscles. So when we're under stress, for whatever reason, the psoas muscle can have an increase in tension. Now I'm going to try and um, get back here to. Can you see my? Can you see my screen? Or are you just seeing me now? Nope, I'm just seeing you and me. Okay, let's go back to here then. I didn't do this effectively. I'll I'll have to learn yeah, how there to you do go. it one day. But that's good. Um, Okay, so the iliopsoas is a hip flexor. It's a complicated muscle that uh, the psoas in particular has an important stabilizing function for not only the spine, but the hip, and it's affected by the autonomic nervous system. And just to illustrate this even further, when we look at the uh, anatomy trains um, in, um, connections, the psoas muscle, which you see here, is part of the very deep myofascial core and is really part of a system that connects the bottom of our feet to our skull. So you can imagine that any dysfunction of the psoas muscle itself can have a large impact on any part of our body, uh, ranging from the back, the hips, to the feet, and even the neck or shoulders. 
And this is a really interesting concept that I came across when I was preparing for um, this discussion today. And it's been put forward by the anatomy trains group and it's called the Cobra core. And they talk about uh, the fact that we focus a lot on core as the horizontal muscles, our abdominal muscles, our back extensors uh, in the pelvic floor. And I, I've always believed that the diaphragm is uh, an integral part of core stability, but they have come up with this concept of a cobra and that because of the fascial bonds that um, are present between the psoas and the diaphragm, and then the hip joint itself, there is a shape that's like a cobra. And there's one cobra on each side, each side of your body, a right and a left. And this cobra needs to be of proper length and tension to maintain proper alignment of your lumbar spine, your pelvis, the SI joint, and your hip. And so if there's a problem where this cobra is too tight or too loose, then this will impact um, the hip function and your ability to breathe. So you can imagine if the psoas was too tight and pulled the lumbar spine into lordosis or extension, and you can even try this on yourself. If you imagine the chin, your chin and your neck were the cobra and you kind of keep that stiff. And as you extend your spine, you would be showing the throat of the, of the cobra. That's gonna influence how we can use our diaphragm to breathe which has a huge impact on our general health. And if the psoas is too loose, then it's going to affect again, uh, the lumbar spine maybe too flat, which can affect the joints in our spine. So this concept of a deep stabilizing structure that's right at the front of the spine, um, that if in proper balance can lead to some very natural stabilization of our lumbar spine and pelvic mechanics, I think is a really interesting one and an important one. So how do you know if you have a tight psoas or tight hip flexors? Um, I do a test called the Thomas test. And what you have to do is, you, most people don't have a flat hard table like this at home, but you can, you can use your stairs, get at the top of a flight of stairs and get your bum very close to the edge of the stairs, lie on your back. I like to bring both of my hips up to my chest and then I hug, my, I hug my legs. And what you're doing here is you're actually stabilizing your pelvis. Then you drop the one leg. So in this case, the left leg is the leg that's being tested. What you wanna see if you don't have tightness of your hip flexors or, um, or your rec fem is that your hip will lie flat on the table and the knee will be bent to 90 degrees. You have to be sure that you're not that you're that you are stabilizing your pelvis and um, by holding on to your your knee. If you don't hold on to your knee, then you can actually cheat a little bit and let the pelvis come down so that your thigh can touch the the bed. So the purpose of holding your your knee is to stabilize the pelvis to detect whether or not you have a tight psoas. And this is what I looked like after I, my pregnancy. My, uh, my, my leg, actually, I think it might've even been worse. My leg was pointing up to the ceiling. I had such a tight psoas. Yikes. <laughs> no, it was horrible. It was unbelievable. Um, and uh, no wonder I had some back pain. You know, it, it's, it, it was just horrible. Now, if you have, you can see on this picture here that the, um, this guy has a, the tight tightness of the hip flexors and his knee is bent at about 90 degrees. I think my rec fem was also so tight because my rec fem was compensating for my psoas. So my knee, my leg was actually sticking straight out as well. Like I was just a wreck. Um, if you're not sure if the rec fem or how much the rec fem is contributing to this lack of ability to have your leg go out straight, you can straighten the knee to take the pressure off the rec fem because the rec fem crosses the hip and the knee. And then you can see whether there's any change in the uh, degree of um, hip flexion. So if you have a tight rec fem and you straighten the knee, your leg may lower a little bit. But most of the time, uh, it's a combination of both. And if, if your rec fem is really tight, your, knee's gonna, your leg is going to be, um, your, your knee is going to be straighter. The other thing that you can test with, or you can see with this test is whether your TFL is too tight. So when you let your leg fall down, if your leg falls off to the side, 
then your TFL, because it's too short, will also um, cause your leg, instead of falling straight down in line with your body like this, your leg falls off to the side. So you can get quite a bit of information from this test. If you have terrible arthritis in your hip and the joint itself doesn't move, you may have a hip flexion contracture. And that doesn't have to do with the muscles, that has to do with the joint. And that's a fixed deformity. Now that's a very, you, you most likely would know because you'd have a lot of pain in your hip and you've probably gone to the doctor and had an x-ray, but you can tell by whether or not you can rotate your foot. If you just lay down flat on your back and you can rotate your thigh inwards and outwards, then it's not likely that you have terrible arthritis in your hip that's creating such a large hip flexion contracture. So why does our psoas get tight? Uh, the, the, I think the most common culprit is sitting. We sit and the psoas muscle is in a shortened position and so it just adapts. There's little cross bridges that develop within the muscle itself. Our little adhesions can develop between the fascia uh, of the iliacus, the quadratus lumborum, uh, and the psoas uh, around the hip capsule which prevent the normal length of the psoas from returning when you stand up. And this doesn't happen after five minutes of sitting, it happens after years of sitting. Um, so it's something that we, we it, this is why it's such a common problem because we all sit. Um, stress, as I mentioned, because of the autonomic nerve supply to the psoas, it can be one of those muscles that just tenses if you're feeling under any kind of stress. And injury, I think actually that the tightness of the psoas comes before the injury. Um, in rare cases, the injury can come first and, uh, and then that leads to changes in the muscle and fibrosis. But most of the time a psoas uh, will get injured because it's short and tight. So what are the consequences of tight muscles? And this is sort of a general concept, um, but certainly applies to the psoas. Uh, if you have a muscle that's always kind of on it's, and, and tight, then you can have pain in the muscle because of what I call metabolic depletion. And what that means, if you take your fist and you, you make a fist as hard as you can, you can see how your knuckles actually go white. There's not as much blood going to that part of the, of the hand. You use up all the oxygen, you use up all the glucose, you use up all the metabolites that your muscle needs in order to stay healthy. And um, it becomes painful. So you're losing that normal rhythm of almost breathing that the muscle needs in order to remain pliable and healthy. Um, when the muscle's always on, it tends to develop painful trigger points and trigger points within the muscle can lead to pain within the muscle itself, but also referral, referred pain into your back, into your thigh, into your groin, uh, into the SI joint area. Uh, and then you lose function because when you have a muscle that's always on, it's not working properly, it's not doing its stabilize, stabilizing function of the spine or the hip. And it, it, because it's not flexing the hip, then other muscles are having to take over. So you, you um, lose function and you develop these compensatory movement patterns. So your TFL can get tight and overworked, your rep fem can be tight and overworked. And then these, um, these changes, if you remember that whole anterior line, uh, can cause problems in your knee, in your hip, in your back, in your shoulder, in your neck. So it, there is a really significant consequence of tight muscles in general. And so when you have a tight muscle, I think one of the key things to do is to learn how to relax that muscle. And um, I have this concept of the muscle meter. Um, and, and really, I think it's important to develop kinesthetic awareness of the psoas. And I really struggled with this. Like I still even wonder if I'm feeling the right muscle as I'm trying to contract and relax it all on my own. Um, and so what I mean by the muscle meter, and you can try this just with your bicep muscle because that's at one that you can see and you can feel. <clears throat> but if you just do an isometric contraction and zero is complete relaxation and 10 is like a maximum isometric contraction, you're creating tension within this muscle. And if you develop an awareness of how turned on the muscle is, how much tension there is in the muscle, you can actually kind of help that muscle to relax because you can increase the tension, then you can release the tension in the muscle and that will help it to relax. The other really interesting thing though with the psoas, because of its location, it's at the 
it's at the back of her abdominal cavity. And there's what we call the abdominal balloon, which is basically the peritoneum, which contains all your internal organs, the intestines, the kidneys. Every time you take a breath, your internal organs actually rise and fall like four centimeters. It's a lot. So there's a lot of motion going on with these internal organs. And because the internal organs lie right on top of the muscle, they can actually massage the muscle a little bit. Uh, and it's interesting when you read about people who do body work, they talk about the psoas as sort of the seat of the soul. It's, it's right near our solar plexus. It's near the center of our body. And so uh, there, there's um, a lot of talk about how emotions go into, into the psoas. So using your breath in a meditative way to relax and combine it with relaxing and contracting to release stress and kick your parasympathetic nervous system into gear can be really beneficial. But the most common thing we do is we hear we have a tight muscle, so we want to stretch it. And you Google hip flexor stretches, and there's got it. Eric, how many hip flexor stretches are there out there? Uh, how many are there? I yeah, mean, after, there's there's a couple of common ones. Yeah, but it's like I see seven stretches for the tight hips and three best hip flexor stretches and five best hip flexor stretches. There's like all sorts of different hip flexor stretches. And, and the bottom line is, well, in my experience, it doesn't work. I tried it. Um, and what I found would happen is that I would stretch and I would feel better for a few hours. Actually, I would feel looser. Um, my back would feel better. Uh, but then the next day, the tightness had recurred in the tissue. And this is a phenomenon when the fascia is stretched, there's a, a, a phenomenon called hysteresis, not hysteria. I was not being hysterical, even though I felt hysterical when my psoas was tight and I had a sore back. But what happens is that you stretch it out and then the tissue goes back to the resting length. And I think that this is because of the cross um, bridges that develop within the fascia, within the muscle, potential adhesions um, in the fascia between muscles. And passive pulling just doesn't lead to any kind of meaningful change in these tissues. Whereas active contraction and relaxation makes a huge difference. And so we take advantage of uh, Sir Charles Scott Sherrington's law. And his law basically states that when you have one set of muscles stimulated, the opposing muscles must be inhibited in order for emotion to occur. So if the hip flexors are turned on, they're, the opposite muscles are the hip extensors. So the glutes need to be turned on to then cause relaxation in the psoas. So we can take advantage of Sheraton's law very effectively to lengthen, relax and lengthen the psoas. Um, but then I think one of the key things is to actually get the other muscles that are turned on and too tight, like the TFL and the rec fem, we need to get them to relax. And so Eric has got some amazing exercises which dissociate hip flexion and um, knee flexion extension and spine flexion and extension and hip flexion and extension, which then allows us to reprogram the muscles and the psoas in particular um, so that it can function in a more normal fashion. And then I think finally, we need to actually strengthen this poor little guy that he, he ends up getting very weak uh, and tight because of uh, longstanding dysfunction and he can't do his job. So in order to prevent the dysfunction from recurring, we have to make sure that the psoas muscle itself is able to pull its weight. And um, so now I just wanted to turn it over to Eric um, to share some of his brilliant exercises uh, to solve the problem. Okay, well, we will jump in there. Thanks so much, Doc. Actually, I was paying, I was able to pay close attention today and it was a great presentation. I think you outlined Thank some you. some unique points. Um, that people don't know about, especially with respect to the nervous system and going through the origin and insertion of the muscle is I think really helpful because you can just see how important this muscle is to the spine. It's known as the hip flexor, but it is so important to the spine. Um, 
And when you're showing the cobra, kind of the cobra on the sides of the spine there, yes, that remind me of when I was in university, actually. Um, I studied under Dr. McGill, Dr. Stu McGill. So he's well known in the, the fitness exercise rehab world. And he had one of my classmates was doing some work with him on um, an undergrad project, but he, he came up with the wet sock analogy of if the psoas is functioning properly and you could contract that muscle. If you just think of it, if it contracts, it's stiff. The muscle lies right on the side, right beside the lumbar spine on the sides. Mm -hmm. So if it's stiff, that's just going to, just from that being stiff, the muscle being stiff, it's going to provide stability to the lumbar, uh, a level of stability to the lumbar spine, um, just from where it lies. So it kind of reminded me of that, that theory mm -hmm. for stability. Um, so great stuff. So you want me to show a couple exercises? Liv, you can wave, stick your hand up. People can say, Hi, so, see ya. <laughs> She's finished her French lesson. Okay, I'm gonna share this first exercise. It's one of our favorites, the slumpy psoas activation. And I think it's, I love this technique just because it does train the two different functions of the psoas. So this, I'm gonna take it from, this is a ROM coach, um, ROM coach technique. So those of you who have the app, you'll, you might know this video, this exercise. The slumpy psoas activation technique yes. activates okay. and strengthens the hip flexor muscle known as the psoas in the range where it's weakest and it's most dysfunctional, which is the shortened range of motion. And this is because of all the sitting we do, we don't need to use this muscle and it gets weak. Start off with a slumped flexed spine and then lift your foot and drive the knee into the opposite hand, activating the hip flexors or the psoas. From there, you go into spine extension and then you release. So again, start in the slumped position, hand to opposite knee and activate while extending the lumbar spine and anteriorly tilting the pelvis. And you hold, feeling those hip flexors, feeling the psoas activating and firing the whole time you're holding. A couple tips to get it firing up is to slightly externally rotate the hip and to slightly abduct the hip. Those two tips can help to get the activation of the psoas that you want. Alternate sides and complete for the prescribed number of reps. Okay, so that is that. How'd that come through, Doc? Yeah, that was good. It's the audio great. okay? And yeah, it's a little softer, but I could hear it very clearly. And uh, okay. no, it, it was fantastic. And, and I want to just point out to everybody, this is a fantastic exercise because you can do it when you're sitting at your desk at work. You're not getting yeah. all hot and sweaty. You don't even have to stand up. You're already slumping probably like if you're like me. Yeah, just get and going. Just get going. And, and you know, you do that once or twice, a couple of times a day, and it make a difference for you. Yeah, frequency. We talk about that when trying to learn to wake up a muscle, activate it. Frequency helps. So doing a few reps, sprinkled throughout the day, morning, afternoon, night, however you want to do it. Uh, that helps you to develop that neuromuscular connection or that neural connection to the muscle to get that guy fired up. And once it's fired up, then you can strengthen it. Uh, so that technique is getting the psoas working, like I said, in the shortened range of motion, which is where it often gets weak. But you do want to work the muscle through its full range of motion. Um, as well as in extension, full extension. So I wanna show one more technique here that will illustrate that. And this technique is also from Rom Coach. It's gonna be in a new routine that's coming out possibly this week, maybe next week called the hip flexion and extension RSR, which stands for range specific routine. So check this one out. This one you do have to get on the ground. So if you wanna join along with me, go for it. This technique will help you to improve your hip extension range of motion. Lie on your side with your top leg in front, knees bent to about 90 degrees. The first activation is into hip extension and you're gonna drive your foot back with the glutes and hold. Try to use your glutes, fire them up and feel them as you're holding and breathing naturally. Then bring your other foot to right in front of your knee and activate into hip flexion. 
by pressing the knee into the heel again holding for about 10 seconds or one to two slow breaths fire up those hip flexors in this activation finally get into hip extension again by driving the foot back activating the glutes and holding make sure to breathe naturally throughout and try to work out that end range and fire up those muscles okay so that is a technique designed to improve your hip extension range of motion but doing that it's not just stretching you know you're not just passively pulling on the tissues but you're activating the glutes those are the muscles that take you into that range of motion into hip extension and you're taking activating the psoas there which are the muscle is the one of the muscles that takes you out of that range of motion so you're able to enter and exit that range and when you develop that type of strength the ability to enter and exit a range that gives you control and that your brain allows you to keep that range of motion. So if you make gains in range, your brain allows you to keep it because it sees, oh, I can get in there, I can hang out there and I can get out of there, no problem, actively under control. So we can, this range is safe. So that's kind of the, one of the fundamental principles of our approach to movement and mobility and improving, getting rid of pain and improving range. Um, and you guys who are following along with us, you know that uh, by pretty well by now, I'm sure. So that's the, the second exercise I, I wanted to share with you guys. I think it's awesome because it, and it uses Sherrington's principle there by actively sure. extending with the glutes, it's going to relax the psoas, so it will lengthen. But then when you're in the lengthened position, you turn the psoas on. It's so important because you, as, as Eric says, then you own that range of motion. Because if you just stretch the psoas into that spot, you know, you take your, you take, you, you know, you grab your ankle and you pull your, your you pull the, the bottom leg to extend your hip. The psoas is just in there kind of not knowing what the hell's going on. It's not being told what to do by anyone or anything. It's getting stretched. And then it's not necessarily even on or off. So it doesn't own anything. So that's why it doesn't last. Yep, exactly. Okay, so that uh, concludes our little presentation there, folks. So if you have any questions about that, drop it in the chat and we will uh, follow up with you. But we're going to get into the questions that have been piling up since we've been talking. So starting off with Wendy. Wendy is asking or saying, my four-year-old grandson can easily lift a 16-kilogram kettlebell. Oh, my goodness. Who's this kid? <laughs> Watch your toes. How can I encourage his natural talent without risking injuries at his age? That's a really interesting question. You know, I think we need to actually start teaching kids once they sit a lot in school, um, basic movement principles, but the most important thing is to have fun and to be playing. And I think a lot of variety, um, making sure that kids take breaks from sitting at school there, they still have pretty good movement mechanics. Now, if you start to see that their posture is really off um, and, and that there's something with their alignment, then you might need to get 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 sort of a, a game that can trick them into correcting correcting the issue. But I think when kids are really little, it's doing movements that are fun and um, and, and stimulating all parts of their system. Yeah, I think um, one thing that I think about I've mentioned this to a couple of my friends is uh, everyday play. If you can just take your kids outside and play something, something physical outside. Uh, if you do it regularly every day, I think they just will naturally get stronger, improve their fitness, but they're going to do things that just continue to facilitate a, a healthy, uh, healthy body that moves well. Um, I wouldn't, with Cam that you can hear kind of singing in the back a little bit, maybe I'm not thinking about any kind of training right now, either of my kids. They're just, every day we get out today, we did some tree climbing, um, we were running around randomly and Cam was on his bike. Uh, Liv and I were practicing uh, cartwheels, which might be pretty terrible, but just playing around, moving your body. Um, and if you have these kids, if you're lucky enough to have little kids, then uh, play with them. Don't just watch them, but play with them too, because they're going to feed off that and, and join you 
and it's just going to be a, a lot more fun than just kind of sitting there, standing there, which we already do enough of. We're already stagnant enough. I, I got to say, I'm very jealous because Cam can already do like, I don't know how many pull-ups when we were at the monkey bars, you know, so you get in the monkey bars and the, you know, the kids are yeah. climbing and, and, you know, like, those are great. Uh, <laughs> those are great. Um, and he's way ahead of me, man. I can't, I can't even do one. By the time I'm 70, I want to be able to do a couple of chin-ups. Oh yeah. We'll get you there. We'll get you there soon. Okay. Sooner than that. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next question. Well, actually, before we get to that, you do have some comments on youth and sport and training and exercise. So why don't you uh, share about that a little bit in terms of the growth plates, and, you know, what to watch out for? Sure. Um, well, I think that what I've observed with a lot of my patients um, in the last 20 years is because of sports specificity, where we have children who are literally four years old becoming like professional athletes, tennis players, gymnasts, swimmers, and they're just doing one motion over and over and over again. Uh, they develop imbalances and they start to develop wear and tear injuries that we used to start to see in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. We start to see them in their teens and their 20s, and it often ends their career. And there's a couple of things that happen is when the growth plates are open, um, if you apply a repetitive force to the growth plates that actually can change the way that the bone grows. So with pitchers, for example, we would see that they have more external rotation in their upper humerus because they're constantly applying this twisting force, internal external rotation force. Um, and it can have advantages and it's not necessarily a bad thing uh, if you're gonna be a professional pitcher, but uh, I think it's so important for kids to play. Um, and so the variety of movement is critical to stimulate all the different muscles, all the different fascia, because if you stimulate them in different ways, then you remain more balanced. It, we can't get children to do like a workout routine to, you know, that's very specific. As, as Eric was saying, the important thing is to get out and have variety. And I start to see uh, injuries with kids when they're going through a growth spurt also, because they bones grow faster than the fascia and the muscles and the tendons can actually adapt. So they lose, the kids lose flexibility and they also haven't had the opportunity to strengthen so that the new length of their arm or their leg is applying greater force on the joints and the tendons. So kids get injured. So watch the volume of activity that kids are doing during uh, their growth spurt. And you, know, you can't just say, okay, at age 12, do this because every 12 year old is different. Yeah. So I think yeah, variety definitely. is the spice of life. Speaking of that, uh, we've got some a set of twins across the street, and they're probably about 15 now, if I'd guess. And they're always outside playing basketball. And one twin is now maybe four inches taller than the other one. Hmm. So even with twins, same age, same upbringing, I'm sure. I'm sure the parents didn't lock the one in the basement uh, more <laughs> than the other one. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's just uh, every every twelve year old, every twin is different, so you can't go by the kind of a really set regimented uh, plan like that. You really have to pay attention and, and know what you're what you're doing when if you're trying to do something uh, very specific. But yeah, play play is where it's at. And you know, I, it was really interesting in the last Winter Olympics. Um, I can't remember. It was one of the Norwegian countries very small country had an unusually high number of medals. And they started talking about what they were doing as a country with their athletes. And they actually didn't allow competition that was, um, you know, winning and losing uh, or judgmental type of competition. It was all about play and having fun and expressing yourself and developing skills. And the kids were rewarded for trying new things for being curious, for working hard, for being determined, having resiliency, uh, having fun. Yeah. And, and it, I think that it really helps to develop a love for movement and a love for sport, which really translates into a love for life. When, you know, it, so I think with kids, it's so important to play and have fun. Mm, for have sure. Have fun, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. B says, have fun, God damn it. Good. <laughs> Good advice. Um, 
And then just to add on a couple of things to that, you know, the four-year-old, just some ideas that popped in my head, tug of war. Uh, we were playing tug of war. You know, if this guy is lifting a 16 kilogram kettlebell, uh, that's an expression of strength. So some strength play. Tug of war is a great one. Um, I don't know, carrying around siblings safely. Maybe wrap them up in a helmet and some pads or something. Just little things like that. Things that can encourage him to be strong, but without you know, following this crazy strength and conditioning program for four year olds. Uh, I think that would be, that's the best, best path. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Ramon, any thoughts on tight scalp fascia? Galio aponeurotica causing hair loss by restricting blood flow to hair follicles. Maybe that's what I have. Gosh, um, you know, honestly, I've never, I've never thought about this <clears throat> before. Um, there's no question though that the fascia of your scalp, as we showed like in the presentation earlier is connected very intimately with the muscular system. And uh, maybe if there is too much tension in there, it will affect the blood flow. I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer to that, but I don't think it'll hurt to do some exercises for the muscles in your scalp and do some massage of your scalp, um, improve the blood flow. Um, and I think stress, I think stress can be something that, that affects um, the, the hair follicles because each one of the hair follicles has a little smooth muscle. And uh, if there's a lot of sympathetic overload, you, could, you know, if you hear your, the fight or flight and your hair stands on end when you're afraid, uh, that maybe is having some kind of an effect, but, uh, uh, I, and I don't think these, these things will hurt. I think that a scalp massage would be very pleasant. Yeah, definitely. I love scalp massages. Um, so I don't have too much to add on to that. If you find the answer, let me know. And, uh, to, to hair loss, let me know. Maybe there's one of the, the root causes over here. Um, okay, next question from the creature 911, 19 years old. Is it possible to fix my hunchback posture at that age and anterior pelvic tilt? Of course, come on. You know what it is, <clears throat> there's, you have to look at a hunchback uh, deformity and I don't mean it in a bad way. We, this is a medical term, we say deformity, you're not deformed. Um, but you have to look at it, whether it's fixed or whether it's flexible. So sometimes in young men, there's a disease called Schurman's disease, where, which actually changes the shape of the vertebral bodies. Or in older women, um, we, we call it a dowager's hump, where they get compression fractures from osteoporosis. When you actually have a change in the bone, it can be difficult to completely correct the hunchback. However, I would really encourage you to do the exercises to prevent the deformity from progressing and getting worse. And uh, it, by strengthening the deep muscles around your spine, you can also uh, protect the bone, protect the joints and decrease any pain. If you don't have those issues, if you don't have any fixed deformity of the bone, then it's 100% possible for you to correct uh, a hunchback deformity with exercises. And Eric has got a phenomenal program for that. Um, and uh, I guess Josh maybe can share a link for that in the, in the, in the chat. Yeah, just a reminder to everybody, um, links will be posted at, oh great. Links will be posted at the end in a comment. <laughs> I can't do anything about that right now. <laughs> so if we talk about links, we're, wait till the end and you'll see them all posted in order. Uh, and then you can visit the links then. No, don't play with it. We want to. No! Okay, something's going on. No! I might have to intervene in a sec. But uh, yeah, Josh, if you could post up the Hunchback video link and the anterior pelvic tilt link, if you haven't seen it, um, that would be great. Okay, next up, question from Garrett. Garrett's 45, uh, fractured lateral process of talus bone in November, 2018. Went for surgery, had a Bromstrom procedure to fix ATFL. What can I do to help heal the peroneal tendons and muscle belly on leg? Okay, so this is a common scenario with uh, an, an ankle sprain. Um, so basically the primary pathology is uh, most likely suffered an inversion injury 
he tore the anterior talofibular ligament and one of the attachments to the lateral ligaments is on the talus. So that basically popped off. Um, I think that the most important thing here at this time is to make sure you've got good mobility of the small joints in your feet, that you've got good ankle dorsiflexion, and then you've got the intrinsic muscles in your feet activated and then that will allow the perineals to turn on and become stronger through range of motion. And um, we've got some fantastic programs uh, on the ROM coach. Um, there, there's a strong feet, there's ankle dorsiflexion RSR, um, which I think are really good. And then the lower limb control program on precision movement probably is the best one for you. And the reason I say this is that the ROM coach routines are fantastic if you've got sort of a minor little imbalance um, to turn on muscles and to get the joints moving. But the, the lower limb control program is um, a little more comprehensive and it goes in a progressive fashion because you have to build on layers here. You can't just sort of do one little magic bullet exercise and fix a complex problem post-surgery. You know, you wonder why were you spraining your ankles in the first place? Have you done it before? You know, is there some kind of, um, you know, weakness in your foot that you had to begin with that led to you spraining your ankle? And so you need to get to the root cause of why you were spraining your ankle. It could have just been you landed on someone's foot and went over. And uh, sorry for that. I had that happen to me too, and it's not fun. But then it, it's really important you address these issues so you don't end up with knee problems, back problems, hamstring problems in the future. Yeah, those, those links will take you to various exercises that you should definitely get going um, ASAP. And he's got a follow-up comment here. I think my muscles are damaged because always your feet not and cracking sounds when I massage the outside leg area. Um, but your muscles probably aren't damaged to the point where you can't get them stronger and better functioning. It's just you got to have the right exercises and the right uh, approach. And I think that's what we try to do and provide. So check out those, those things that Dr. B mentioned, and those will definitely get you on the right path. And there, there's, there's no question cracking. You can sometimes see if there's just a little bit of scar or feel or here, um, if there's a little bit of um, fibrosis or scar tissue around the perineal tendons. Sometimes we see with lateral ankle sprains that the perineal tendon will actually sublux right over the lateral malleolus. And that's a pretty defined clunk. It's not so, it, it can be a crack. If that's going on, you need to talk to, um, you need to talk to your doctor. But what I, what I would do before I entertain doing any kind of surgical reconstruction of the, of the retinaculum over that tendon is lengthen the perineal tendon. So a lot of active self myofascial release of the perineal muscle uh, but just like we were talking about earlier today with tight muscles, um, you have to look at the root cause of why the perineal is too tight. So you have to get all the other muscles in your foot and in your, in your uh, leg working properly so that um, the perineal muscle isn't constantly turned on and tight. Yeah, I just thought I'd pull this up so you get an idea of where this is. The peroneals are, are over here, just lateral ankle yes. muscles, also known as the fibularis, but I always call, I call them the peroneals as well. Yep. And if you take your arrow guys, down at the tip of the, of the fibula, uh, fibula there, Eric, that's where sometimes the perineal tendon will flip onto the front side of the fibula. So if you have a really bad, yeah, if you have a really bad lateral ankle sprain and you tear that retinaculum as well, then that can happen. But I would assume, and never, you know, what do they say about assuming? Uh, makes an ass of you and me. But um, I would assume that the fact that you've had surgery, that your surgeon would have recognized that you had subluxing perineal tendons and repaired that at the time that you had the operation. So the cracking is most likely related to fibrosis and scar tissue. And, and uh, so long as it's not painful, I don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. We get that question all the time. You know, I've got this popping in my X joint. Should I be worried about it? And unless there's pain, um, probably not. If it's a little discomfort, if it's a bigger clunk and it's a little discomfort, uncomfortable, especially around the hip, there is something that you can do about that. Um, but I'll talk about that in a sec because you yeah, have the next question here, kind of related. Uh, it's from Jan. For years, I sat on my wallet 
as a computer programmer and realized it didn't help my lower back or hip flexors. Any comments? Well, I think sitting on your wallet could even bring a little more asymmetry into the situation, depending on how full your wallet is. <laughs> yeah, how much money you got in there. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's likely that you've run into the same issues. And, and interestingly, um, <clears throat> if the wallet raised your hip and made that side even shorter, you might have had more pain on the other side because it's having to compensate for the really short psoas on the one side. So that's kind of a, uh, one of the tricks that we, we run into is that you have dysfunction on one side of the body and because the other side of the body is compensating so significantly, it actually becomes more painful. Um, but I would basically follow the principles of trying to uh, lengthen both of your psoas, get both your cobras going and, um, and use the exercises that Eric um, described earlier. It'll be, it'll, on both sides, it will help you significantly. And if you search psoas or hip flexor on our YouTube channel, you'll find a lot of stuff um, if this yeah. interests you more. And there's a live session where I go through maybe four exercises and some more information that might be beneficial. And I know everybody who comes here um, likes to be educated. So that session is probably a good one to check out. Sure. But uh, yeah, keep, keep balanced. I mean, I lost the wallet out of my back pocket a long time ago, which results always results in me losing my wallet or whatever is supposed to go in there. Like I was telling you before I lost my passport. Um, I left it in the airplane in the front seat pocket in front of me just because I don't like stuff in my pocket. I hate stuff in my pockets because I do feel that imbalance or throws me off a little bit. So yeah, just remember where you put stuff. Okay, next question from the one, the only Susanna. Are there hip flexor exercises specific to tennis players? Well, um, hello, Susanna. Um, yes, they're, well, they're, they're kind of specific to anybody, you know, but they're <laughs> very important for tennis players because the psoas muscle really tends to be dysfunctional in tennis players. Um, and I think a great routine um, on ROM coach actually is the tennis mobility one. There is the um, hip dissociation um, yep. exercise in there. Um, so I would recommend checking that out. Um, I like the hip car controlled articular uh, rotations. I think it's also a great exercise for tennis players um, because it turns on your muscles in um, the full range of motion. Uh, including flexion, extension, internal and external rotation, abduction. It's like got all combinations of, um, of um, movement. And in tennis, there is, a, there is a lot of rotation through the hip. And so it's critical that you do take good care of your, of your hips and your psoas. Cool. Yeah, I, I would say exercises could be beneficial but like dr b said every exercise is probably beneficial for everybody at some point it's just you might have a couple that uh, you do a little more often um because of your your sport but the rotation for sure with the hip when you're rotating into it you're going into internal rotation on your front hip if you're doing like a forehand you need that you need that healthy because that could lead to lateral ankle sprain if it's not there knee issues, meniscus issues, because then all the rotational force goes through the knee. Um, so that hip rotation for any anybody who plays a sport where you run and you change directions, hip rotation is critical for healthy knees and healthy ankles, not just healthy hips. Okay, um, just a quick time check, everybody. It's one o'clock, so we will be going for maybe another 10, 15. We'll try to get to everybody's questions, but uh, if we are unable to, Come back next week, next Thursday at noon. We'll be here and we'll try to get to you then. Come early and plug your question in early and we'll definitely get to it. All right, next up is from Shane. Shane is a 34-year-old strongman. Good to meet you. I'm a 40-year-old strongman. Uh, <laughs> torn labrum, front of the hip socket, impedes movement and hip flexion, sometimes catching. This would increase psoas tension as a compensatory phenom phenomenon. Um, 
I'm question. not sure what comes first, the chicken or the egg. I think when the psoas is dysfunctional, that it doesn't lead to the um, femoral head sitting concentrically within the hip and you lose your hip pocket. So that's a big problem for anybody with uh, FAI and labral tears. And, um, you know, the catching could actually be the psoas, uh, if, unless you've got like a massive labral tear, which most of the labral tears that I read about on an MRI are sort of a delamination where there's some um, separation of the labrum from the bone, but there's not actually an unstable fragment of the labrum that's moving in and out of the joint because the labrum, particularly in the hip, is really around the circumference of the acetabulum. And so unless you have a large, large tear where the piece has gotten caught into the, caught in the joint, most popping and cracking, um, I think, is, is related to a very tight psoas, which can actually click um, as you go from uh, flexion more when you're going, I find, from flexion to extension because the yep. psoas turns off and isn't doing its job. Yep. Um, it's gravity takes over. You just let gravity take over. I do it all the time and it makes me crazy. It's <laughs> like, you know, my, I, I can't believe how dysfunctional my psoases are at times. Um, so I would really um, focus on releasing the tissues at the back of your, um, your buttock. So getting um, the deep six, the piriformis, the, um, the glutes mobilized and lengthened from the hip capsule and then um, activating your psoas. And very shortly, we're coming out with a routine, which I think is fantastic. Um, Eric has got this exercise um, the, the, that's phenomenal for helping to create and maintain a, a hip pocket, um, which will really benefit you. So look out for that in the next uh, month. Yeah, it's called the Foundation for Movement Longevity Routine Program. Um, and we're just, we're working on that now. So when it's live, we'll let you know. Make sure you're on our, our email list. And Is that why I was swearing at the cat? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, I think that was a different video. <laughs> no, that was the new, new differential diagnosis videos. Um, on that, I want to share this. And we're going to post a link to this in a sec. But this is called the five-day hip mobility challenge. And it's something you can sign up for. It's a free five-day course where every day there's an exercise or exercises and some info. And one of the things that we deal with here is this snapping hips and clunking hips. Um, and it's exactly what Dr. B is talking about, it's getting the psoas on and then learning how to keep the psoas on as it lengthens. And that's what happened, what you need to maintain centration of the hip joint and to avoid that big clunk feeling. And once you get it with the, the drills that I, I teach in there, um, you understand what it is. It's less freaky because now you know what's going on. So if it happens, it's like, oh, okay, no big deal. It's just, you know, my psoas is turned off. And then you know how to how to fix it, how to strengthen it and keep it on. So check that out. Sign up for the course. It's free. And Josh will throw a link into the comments at the end of the show. Uh, next question is from WL. We're going to go into um, high words per minute mode. Notice <laughs> that my right foot tends to point outwards while my left can point forward while standing. Not sure if this is due to my exotosis, if muscular, what might tight, what might be tight and causing this? And WL is 32. Okay, hi WL. Um, it, could be, it could be related to an exostosis, but one of the most common reasons, I, I look at the foot and ankle, it's a lack of dorsiflexion at your ankle, which doesn't allow you to keep your foot straight and move forward. Or the other is really tight external rotators of the hip so that they actually pull your hip into external rotation because your glutes haven't been working well. So those are sort of the two areas where I look for um, when I see people walking uh, with their feet in external rotation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, check the ankle dorsiflexion video here on YouTube. You'll, I talk about that phenomenon in there where how ankle dorsiflexion relates to overpronation, flat feet, that kind of thing. Um, and start working on it. Most of us could benefit from more ankle dorsiflexion. So it's something that pretty much everybody 
um, should address at some point, even if you're okay. It doesn't hurt to address it for a month, focus on it for a month, because it's such an important range in that every step you take, if you don't have ankle dorsiflexion, sufficient ankle dorsiflexion range, there's going to be a little compensation somewhere up the chain, and that's going to result in greater wear and tear at the knee, in the hamstrings, in the hip, at the spine, somewhere um, that you could nip in the bud before it gets painful. So check out that video if you are interested in, in that. Next up is J-Main. Can aggressive foam rolling cause micro tears or other damage? Melt people and others. Um, I don't know who melt people are. Say it can and that melt hydrates tissues. Thoughts? I wonder if I'm too aggressive rolling, especially in the IT area. So maybe somebody can tell me what melt is. So I'm not familiar. But not uh, familiar what do you think? With... I'm not, I'm not familiar with melt, but I think that if you do foam roll too aggressively, you can cause bruising. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to tear fascia rolling on it. Um, oh, yeah. I, it's so, so it's tough. Strong. Yeah, it's and strong. super strong. Um, I think that you're, you're going to get an indication with a lot of pain and definitely, you know, you can see some bruising and that probably isn't the fascia. It's probably the subcutaneous tissue, like the, the fat that's around the fascia that's causing it, that, that bleeds and breaks down. So you don't want to ever be rolling that aggressively that you're causing tissue damage. And the way that you know that is listen, you know, if it's killing you and, and you're like, it's, it shouldn't be torture. It can be uncomfortable. And I know, especially when you first start, it can be very painful. So go lightly, but each day that you do the rolling, um, the pain seems to be less. You can go a little deeper, you can go a little further and go slow and steady. Um, so, you, you know, I think that you can, especially if you're rolling a tissue right over a bone, I can imagine that there could be some, more of the muscle would be affected, I think, than the fascia or a nerve could be affected, the softer tissues. Um, so you have to be gentle when you're doing foam rolling and, and, uh, do we know what melting is? I'm curious now. Melt. Uh, melt is a method using balls to release muscle tension, different types of balls and soft foam rollers. So basically just, uh, an acronym for rolling. Maybe there's some specifics there, but. Um, I, I think that using balls can and uh, different tensions can allow you to get into the tissue a little bit more specifically. Um, they can they can have their advantages. I think it's a tool. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah. I mean, if it's killing you, if you feel like you're going too too hard, then just back off. Foam rolling isn't going to cure all your issues. It's the start. So do some foam rolling, do it for one to two minutes on an area. That's what I typically recommend when you first start doing it. If it's the first time you've ever done it, do it daily for a week or two weeks, and then you should drop down. Um, if you can't drop down, it's because you're not doing the other stuff you need to do, which is activating the muscles, strengthening them, integrating them into movement patterns, all the stuff that we follow up and do after foam rolling. Foam rolling is the start and it's a small piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. So that's a great point. And, and the other thing is, if you do have a foam roller that's too hard, I've seen people with these spikes and things that, you know, that can, that can hurt. So get a softer roller. That's where maybe the melt balls are more beneficial. You're talking about the SM, S and M method, Doug? I don't know. I'm not familiar with that one either. Maybe you could do a presentation on that later. <laughs> I'd have uh, to do a lot of research. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Next up, Jan, again, I am 73. What would be the impact of mild osteoarthritis in some of the vertebrae where the psoas joins the spine? Can the tight psoas cause stress so that you get into a bad cycle? So two questions there. So um, the psoas, I do believe the psoas is very important for the alignment and stability of your spine. At 73, if you only have mild arthritis, I'm applauding you. I think that's fantastic. And I wouldn't get too worried about the x-ray result. Uh, and I would focus on trying to maintain a healthy psoas to prevent any further wear and tear in your spine. Uh, sorry, what was the second question? Can tight psoas cause stress so that you get into a bad cycle? So yes, the other it, way around. Yes, yes, it can. And so 
Um, if the psoas is too tight, um, as we talked about with the, the cobra co uh, concept that you can pull the thread or the, sorry, the lumbar spine into, uh, the wrong alignment, or you can't, you don't maintain the correct alignment of the hip because of a tight psoas, then it can lead to abnormal wear and tear. So using your breath to relax the psoas in combination with the exercises that Eric uh, showed us today would really benefit you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Okay. And uh, one of the other points I forgot to mention it as we were talking about relaxing the psoas, one of the ways to relax it is actually to learn how to activate it. That helps because when you can activate it and you can ramp up that tension, then you know what tension on and tension off feels like. So you can control it. So it's not just about, sticking something into it like a finger or a, a ball or a roller but also learning to activate it that's another necessary piece of the puzzle that will help you to relax that muscle all right uh, raise is it better for the pain in the hip area to subside before doing strengthening exercises or can we do both exercises uh okay so let's just leave out the last part so what I would suggest is you have to understand why your hip is painful. So if it's painful due to a muscle imbalance, say the TFL is a common one or the, or the psoas, which we've been talking about today, what you need to do is relax the muscle that's too tight and turn on the other muscles that aren't working um, effectively and actually relax the compensatory muscles. So what we've talked about today is using our breath to um, relaxed tissue to learn how to activate it and control the tension in the muscle using a muscle meter, uh, doing some foam rolling to release and relax tissue tension, but then you need to turn on and activate all of the muscles around the hip in order to prevent the muscle from being overused or overloaded again. So it depends on how much your pain you're in and whether there's an acute injury, but let's assume that there's no acute muscle tears. That this is a chronic overly tightened muscle. I think it's really important to follow the principles, principles we've just outlined, but you're not going to strengthen as in like go and try and do like a squat with 300 pounds. You're going to have to build your foundation for movement first, which is the principles we've been talking about. And then once you have your foundation, then you build endurance, strength, power, speed. Yeah. Yeah. If it's, if there's no acute injury, then typically activating the muscle will help to decrease some of that pain. Um, so it's a good thing, but activating using exercises like we've shown here that we're going to link to at the end of the show, that's the kind of stuff that you want to do, not the max back squat. Okay. Um, next question. I'm going to just cover this one. 30 year old Omega metal chase 92 uh, snapping hip syndrome. Go do that five day course that I, I had mentioned earlier. We'll have a link to it at the end. Um, You'll learn about it and you'll learn exercises on how to deal with it, as I was mentioning. Uh, Phil Stevens, I'm 57, waiting for hip surgery, have a weight loss goal. What can I do to exercise now that walking walking has become difficult? Um, that's a great question. And I think that really important is to try and uh, build your core and awaken the muscles around your hip so that after your hip replacement, you have the right movement pattern so you don't overload the joint replacement and have it fail. And you'll find that if you do these exercises before the procedure, you'll, you'll, you'll recover very quickly. Um, the TFL pain program is an excellent program to get started. You might have to modify things a little bit if you're, um, if you're really limited in your mobility uh, with the hip, but it, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great start. And then you're talking about a weight loss goal um, focus on your, your intake, your nutrition there, the exercise, keep that as kind of a separate thing in terms of this is going to help me move better. It's going to help me with my activities of daily living and use nutrition to fuel your weight loss goal. Um, don't try to exercise for your weight loss goal, especially in light of, you know, what's going on with you. If you've got a hip surgery coming up, that means something's going on. And if you have this weight loss goal, that's going to get you to push yourself beyond what your body's telling you to do. And that's just going to cause further issues. So great idea to lose weight. 
you've got hip issue, wear and tear of the hip, losing weight will definitely help, but use nutrition to support that goal. And I agree with that. And I think it's very important that this just has to be a lifestyle change for you. That's something you're going to do for the rest of your life, that it's not a diet you're going to do to um, help your hip. It's a diet you're going to do to help your general health and overall movement longevity and longevity in general. So stick to the basic principles and find something that you really enjoy and that you can do every day. And over time, your body will remodel. Okay, I think we get to the last two. Melinda, I started doing some of the hip rotation exercises on ROM coach, and soon after, my hips started popping more often. Is that normal? Hmm. Um, I don't know if it's actually normal, but it could be that you're not maintaining the psoas activation. And so, checking out the uh, link to the, the hip course that um, Eric has mentioned would be the smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the, perhaps you've increased your range of motion, but you don't, haven't fully increased the control uh, through that range. Um, this can happen with, I think, those who are hypermobile to begin with. So check out that course and, uh, and that should be able to, that should help you out or at least shed some light on, on what's going on there. And then last question from Mark, dealing with plantar fasciitis for about a year. I've released the toes, feet, and everything upstream to the knee. I think my extremely tight hip, external hip rotator has caused my ankle to dump in, causing, possibly causing the issue. Mark's 55. He's a 30-year bodybuilder, and he's on phase two of lower limb control. I think that your assessment is correct and that you need to go slow and steady and um, may need to throw in some more hip activation exercises um, to, to help with that. Yeah, get, get that internal rotation of the hip going. Because if you've got extremely tight external hip rotators, activating the internal rotators, which are often off, especially if you've squatted a lot, um, deadlifted a lot, and you've always been told, you know, push those knees out. Those external rotators are gonna be strong, but the internal rotators got nothing. So once you strengthen those internal rotators and start working that range of, internal rotation that will lengthen those external rotators and that might help to alleviate some of the tightness there um, and then just all the hip muscles getting them all working who knows what exactly could be the issue there's so many little muscles in there uh, and one of them that's off can cause other issues down the line other compensations so i i would recommend you're on lower limb control also if if the hip is the root then check out hip control because there's yeah. a big focus on internal rotation there. And that could help to, to deal with the, the hip issues you've got going on. Okay. So I think that's it. That's it. We are I, off. Actually, I have one request of everybody watching and that is, um, could you, could you just give us one comment uh, and one, one takeaway from today that you, that you learned just one thing that you learned and it doesn't have to be long, but just uh, it's great for Eric and I to be able to uh, understand what you're learning and how we can make it even better. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll be back here next Thursday, a week from now, same time, same place. And we've got anything else to watch out for. Um, we've got the arthritis, knee arthritis stuff coming out soon hopefully next week. So a couple of YouTube videos on knee arthritis, one with a lot of background information, one with exercises and a couple of routines. Uh, so if you have knee arthritis, you'll want to check that out. And we've got a couple of new routines coming out for ROM coach. I just finished the, the voiceovers on some of the videos this week. So we've got hip flexion extension RSR, which is related to today's presentation. And we've got strong feet two. So right now, strong feet one is in there. And strong feet too is the follow-up. So if you want strong feet, you want a good arch, um, you want toes that work, these routines are, are really good for you. Okay, so that's it. Thank you, everybody. Um, we'll look forward to reading your comments in the chat or in the comments section at the end. Links will be posted at the end. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay.